Um, All right, so let's start with, okay. the, with that. Uh, if I consider the extremity muscles in a group of their fun main functions, in the shoulder we find muscles that hold the scapula to the trunk, some that hold the humerus into the shoulder joint, which is the scapula mainly, and then we have a bunch of muscles that move the upper arm around. First, let's anchor the shoulder to the trunk. Most of those muscles attach at the medial or vertebral area of the scapula, and reach upward into the back or wrap around the rib cage, pulling the shoulder towards it. In the back, we got one that's named levator scapula. I want you to visualize that muscle as it reaches from the medial upper border of the scapula up to uh, up the side of the upper neck to the vertebra one, two, four. Can you visualize that muscle? Yes. yes. Yeah. Good. So let's go to that muscle here. I always have to. So the way I look at this stuff is, let me see if I put this. Uh, the way I look at, at the muscles, because there's all these different friggin' names, right? And so you got to ideally group them and not look at them only as individuals. Um, and there is actually some reason for not looking at muscles at individual muscles and more looking at them functionally as chains of motion patterns and things like that. But I look at them like one set of muscles attach the shoulder blade to the chest. And like the one we talked about here, we have muscles back in here that are from the medial border of the scapula and reach towards the vertebral area, either the mid back or also into the neck, which is this levator scapula right here, goes into the neck, right? And so that anchors the shoulder blade medially there. And then we have muscles, a muscle that comes from the inside of the shoulder blade around the ribs. And you see that in boxers, that's really strong you know, finger-like projections on the side of the chest when they push uh, with the fists. Uh, that's also a shoulder anchoring muscle. And then uh, another one we have here in the front that reaches a little bit down. That's the coracoid process right in here, actually, that tip. And that goes down like that. Hey, wait a minute. I have a little thing. I can annotate. No, I don't want to annotate. You guys can see what I'm doing, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. Does that make <laughs> sense? Those those yeah. few muscles? Okay, so that's what we're looking at right now. Um, and so the first one we got is that shoulder anchor, that levator scapula, and it attaches up here in the neck and reaches, that's the back of the, ba that's the, back of the neck right here, and it reaches from the, um, sort of, uh, the, the neck down to the tip of the shoulder blade, and it pulls it up, so it elevates the scapula, if you can visualize that, as it contracts. All that muscle does is shorten, right? So it, it, it pulls from the origin it's, it anchors, the origin is where it anchors and the insertion pulls towards the origin. And so when you visualize, what does that do? Well, if that muscle only contracts, it reaches that whole shoulder blade upward. But also, it sort of rotates it down a little bit. And so the glenoid here goes downward a little bit. Can you visualize that? Anybody? Uh, kind of. Kind of, I yeah. know I can't really see it. Well, let's see, maybe I can make it so you can see me. I don't know how to do that. I get it, but you said the glenoid. What is the glenoid? Oh, I oh, see it. I see it. Yeah, yeah. okay. The glenoid. The, 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 that upward. the glenoid is the shallow piece here at the shoulder blade, the scapula. Yeah. yeah. That the humerus fits into. The head of the humerus touches the glenoid. I see it. On the next page, it has two X's next to it. So oh. I guess that's it. Oh, wait, here? The next page. One more down? Yeah, is that it right there? Which the one? T where it says TRP1. The gray part with the two X's on the head. Oh, no, these are trigger points. No, no not there, the one to the left. This one? Is that it? Yeah. No, no. Uh, uh, close, close. Let's, let's go back to the anatomy. The, the glenoid, the glenoid is, is this piece right here that I'm marking. Oh, so that's the, the whole shoulder blade, right? That's the whole shoulder blade. The glenoid okay. is this piece that the head of the humerus sticks into. Okay. So it's that weird picture from the side mm -hmm. of the homework. You had that weird picture from the side that nobody really knew what it was. Okay. Because I, right. I haven't taken it out yet. Now I took it out, by the way. Um, but that that was um, that's that piece here. And so what happens is when this muscle contracts, the shoulder blade rotates that, this way, clockwise a little bit here. And so okay. because it pulls it up on one side and 
right about here is the sort of the center of rotation when you look at an axis it's like a wheel you know in the wheel you have a center and then the, the tire is on the outside right and the center doesn't move but it anchors the wheel into the frame onto the axis axle and so that's the same thing so this point here is sort of stabilized and when this contracts this muscle alone contracts it rotates the shoulder blade downward and that's what this means. Rotate the glenoid cavity down means rotating the shoulder blade down. Oh, uh, cool. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. So then that's, what's that? So elevate the scapula is basically the answer here, right? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Because you've got to help me. These things, I always have to think them through. Muscle stuff, you know, it's interesting. And, and when you look at the name also, right, you've got the name, he levator. Le you know, elevating the scapulae, that's in the name. Levator means raising something up. Does that make sense? You get that? Yeah. All right. So you always, look, you always look at the name. So elevating the scapula is right in the name of that muscle. And this muscle is very, very important uh, when you look at treatments of people. And that's why I put these. These are trigger point charts. So the, the red area that I put on every muscle is that where people hurt when their muscle has a problem. And the axis, if you're a massage person, is where you can find pressure points that if you squeeze those, then um, uh, uh, you get relief from these pains, pain areas, very likely. So I put those up. Not that you need to do it, but that at least it gives you some relevance into the real world. What does this mean to me? All right? And maybe some of you want to use it. Um, all right. Good, next. The other muscle on the back attached to the scapula to the spine reaches from the vertebral border of the spinous process to the mid and upper back. What is that muscle called? Rhomboids. Yes. Anybody get that? Yes. So we have the continuation. If you look at this picture down in here, the levator scapula is this muscle and then below Further down, these are the rhomboids. And the rhomboid's name is because it's a geometric structure. It's two parallel surfaces that are not in the right angle. That's a rhomboid, a geometric rhomboid. And so that's um, all I wanted to say about these, I think. There are a lot of layers. You mean from superficial to deep? Yeah, just the human body itself. Yeah, it's, no, it's very interesting. I mean, yeah, because then you got the trapezius on top, right? And it overlays them a little bit. So the, the rhomboids, well, this is not really a good picture. The rhomboids are here, and then the levator scapula is here, which is not shown here. But then the trapezius is on top of that whole thing, which you can see that right here, the trapezius. Yeah. And we talked about the trapezius a little bit before, but here's another discussion of the trapezius in terms of what does it do to the shoulder. In the axial skeleton, in the axial muscles, I talk about the trapezius, what does it do to the to the to the spine to the neck and here it's more about what does it do uh to the to the shoulder so it does a whole bunch of stuff to the shoulder if you think about it's attaching um <clears throat> the, the spine of the scapula which is right here the spine of the scapula the acromion which is the tip of the shoulder blade and then the front the clavicle a third in the front here on this side a third of the clavicle also has trapezius muscle so it wraps around the thing and then goes on to the neck into the and into the mid back all the way down to t12 which is basically at the top of your low back down in here and so you can only visualize how many things this muscle does when it moves and um, it's the most superficial layer and often you see the more superficial a muscle is the more movements it does the more deeper a muscle is the more it it's it's part of protecting and, and stabilizing more. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see if you have a question with this. Since I'm ahead of myself, if you put a palm of your hand on top of shoulder, and squeeze the next muscle. That's that next muscle. Usually feels good when it's work because he gets tired holding the shoulder blade up over time. That's correct. We all know that one, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is Right, is a bra more superficial, covering most of the upper back as well as the back of the neck. What is the muscle called? So that was the trapezius. Yep. If you have questions, you speak up, okay? Okay. Okay. All right. 
I know, it's a little awkward doing the monologue without seeing you, really. And if you don't want to be in a video as a picture, you got to make sure you take your video off, please. I mean, it's just a small little picture on the side. It's not a big deal, but just hey, professor? In, case in case you're sensitive for that. Mm -hmm. um, so on number three, I'm, I think I, I put trapezius, and I think it told me it was wrong. Or maybe, maybe, I, would, maybe I chose another one and it was wrong, but no. everybody else get that one? And it went went through. Yeah, I yeah. think it was a different question where I supposedly got it wrong, though. Yeah. Oh, maybe Wait, a number, 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 number though. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Since we're here, let me do this. Uh, number three, you were saying, huh? Hmm. So you said number three? Uh, yes. I could be mixing it up with another one, though. That should be trapezius. Yeah. All right, so you tell me. Okay, I'll, make, I'll take a note and go look afterwards. Okay, cool. So number three is trap. All right. Um, and then this is number four here. If you watch boxing, oh, this is the other muscle. That's cool. If you watch boxing, you know of this one because it holds the shoulder blade, the scapula, to the chest. Punching okay. things will make this muscle very strong. That's like when you do push-ups, for example. You can feel that strength, that building on the side. Uh, you can see a finger like bulges following the ribs on either side of the chest when it contracts, almost looking like it's a serrated knife. What's that muscle called? Serratus Hmm. That one down is here. That, so that's, but I can that. count it. So that is superior. Wait, say that again. Serratus. 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 I don't know. Serratus. Oh, serratus. Serratus. serratus anterior. Yeah. Is is the way that they um, speak it out. And serratus comes from the serrated knife, the way it looks. All right. So that's why that sometimes I mean these names, they're actually not even that complicated. Mm -hmm. Just we don't think about it like that. At least I don't. It took me a long time to think of these things like that. And it's actually a really nice muscle. It's right here. And if you reach underneath your armpit and you push on the ribs and it hurts, you know that muscle's messed up. It's a little bit sensitive. Has a very big job. It holds that shoulder blade to the chest. And it's a lot of in a lot of us it's not that strong. Oh um, all right, let's go to the next one. I know more push ups. <laughs> Well, I've been lazy with this weather. It's crazy. Um, all right. Lastly, in this bunch, we have one muscle that starts in the front of the coracoid process and reaches down inward and inward and attaches on the ribs. It's underneath the big arm muscle that we'll discuss soon. Can you think of that muscle's name? Pectoralis minor. Pectoralis minor. So the muscle we know about is the chest muscle the pec major where is my pec major coming up down further down so the pec major you see here that's the big one here that's attached all the way here all the way here all the way here there. but then that goes into the arm so the pec major actually moves your arm that's why when you train it you move the you move the arm around uh, the, underneath that is the pec minor so when the name is this, a little deceptive because it doesn't really have that much to do with it because the pec minor is attached here to the coracoid process and it reaches into the ribs. So the major is attached here and goes into the arm. And the minor is attached on the coracoid process underneath the major and reaches into the ribs and works, works basically holding the scapula down. Depress and rotate the shoulder blade down and pull it forward. If we can visualize when these contract, it pulls the shoulder blade down and a little bit forward. Or this is where you can have a change in action in origin and insertion, really, because when you take a deep breath, this muscle can elevate and raise up the ribs. So you can take a deep breath, you can see that. Oh, here, this is not a bad picture of the difference between the pec major and the pec minor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. So we have now pretty much covered 
the muscles that anchor the shoulder blade, the scapula, into the chest and into the neck. We have some in the back. We have one that comes underneath on the, on toward, around the chest, and then we got one here in the front. And now what we can do is we can go to the next set of muscles, which will be the ones that hold the arm into the humerus, the arm bone into the shoulder joint, which that is, again, that's the glenoid cavity. When we say glenoid cavity, we mean the part of the shoulder blade that the head of the humerus sticks into, goes into. It's easier in the, in the pelvis, it's easier to understand. The glenoid cavity in the pelvis is the acetabulum if you want to compare it. So it's the socket, mm -hmm. it's the joint socket. It's just in the shoulder joint, you don't have a round joint, joint socket. What you have in, in us, um, around that glenoid cavity, you have a little, um, uh, uh, called a labrum that goes around. It's a plastic ring that goes around it that holds the head of the humerus into the shoulder joint. Did anybody see a picture of that? Uh, this is all too complex here. Well, when we meet and then find a picture, I'll show you a picture. Okay, never mind. Let's move on here. Okay, so the shoulder is very flexible yet strong. The rotator cuff are four muscles, three of them spanning from the back of the scapula to the greater tubercle, which is the bump on the outside of the upper arm bone. And then one reaching from the underneath the shoulder blade to the lesser tubercle in the front of the shoulder. Can you name those muscles? The, ter the um, teres minor, the okay. supra-pinatus, supra okay. the infraspinatus, and the supercalaris. Subscapularis. There you go. So, yeah, so when we look at them here, let's talk about those. So... They called the you rotator can, cuff. Huh? Speaking of this, I wrote all my answers down, but it, my internet was down in my house, and I live in like a, I don't know, my building doesn't have Wi Fi, but I did do my questions and wrote it down on the paper. Oh, perfect. Yeah, it'll be okay. Gonna, so it's going to be late, but out. I'm going to try to answer it all so you know I did them all. Yeah, yeah, we'll figure that all out. And, and you know, today I want to go through the first nine questions, and then on Wednesday I want to go to the rest, the other set of questions on the same chapter. Okay, mm -hmm. so we'll do one chapter per week, not not one chapter each day. Okay. okay. Um. So yeah, so here are the muscles. So the collectively those four muscles called the rotator cuff muscles. They basically hold that arm into the shoulder blade. And uh, we also call them the SITS muscle for, SITS stands for supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Um, really fascinating muscles. Let me see, do I have more questions on these muscles before I just mm -hmm. talk about them? Oh no, look, we're gonna go afterwards, we're gonna go to the arm mover. So let's let's finish with these rotator cuffs. So the, the reason why I made you guys study the shoulder spine of the scapula and then the sub supraspinous fossa, infraspinous fossa, and subscapular fossa is because of those muscles. And so the muscle <clears throat> above the spine, the supra is above spine of the scapula, is the supraspinous. Mm -hmm. And that muscle is one that um, is very interesting. It, 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 it holds the humors into the shoulder joint but it also moves the arm outward when it contracts so it's attached up here and it yanks it it, it, it inserts into the humerus in the greater tubule here and when it shortens and it contracts it brings the arm outward a little bit and it actually helps another muscle that we'll talk about is the deltoid muscle the deltoid muscle is the shoulder pad muscle on us. They're like the, when you touch your shoulder, that's the muscle you touch here on the outside. So it attached to the spine of the scapula to the clavicle and goes all the way around to the outside of the arm. And that muscle, one of the big functions is to help bring the arm outward and, and abduct the arm, so to speak, uh, right here, a arm abduction. But the, sh the deltoid is attached. Let me show you the deltoid since we're doing that real quick. Here, the deltoid is attached in such an angle steep down that 
it cannot raise the, it cannot abduct the arm when it's hanging down it can only abduct the arm when it's about at this angle if it's a ta if it's contracting from this angle it just yanks the arm into the into the uh, shoulder joint does that make sense yep a little bit yeah. so and so don't the, we have deltoid in our ankle too no, hold on. Let's let's go to the ankle afterwards. Let me finish this one real quick. Okay. We do have similarities, but this one is unique okay. to the shoulder here. Um, okay. And the supraspinatus, then, when it contracts, oops, up here, it you know it it gives that advantage that it can contract here, and by doing so, it brings that initial abduction. It abducts that arm initially, and then after that, the deltoid can take over and and finish the job up. All right. And so what was that, Shamim? The, the ankle? Said, like in our ankles and our foot. Because I remember when we did the, the, the four packet. Uh-huh. I think it was on our foot as well, but I'm not sure. Well, we'll, we'll do, we'll do the, 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 the leg muscles are Ooh. a little bit different down here. The hip has some similarities. Um, and those come in when we talk about the infraspinatus right in here. That's the below, the sp infras below, right? Spine or the scapula. And then the teres minor is very similar. The teres minor is just attached here at, this, at the edge of the shoulder blade and then goes into the greater tubercle here. But those muscles, for example, what they really help you with besides holding in the arm into the glenoid cavity, into the shoulder blade, is they rotate the humerus laterally. They sort of, when you visualize, you, you, you take your, you, you bend your elbow and you can, you bring the fist to the outside. You bring the, the, the hand to the outside. That's lateral rotation. Those muscles, when they pull on this, that's what they do. And we have similar muscles in the hip, in the, in the glute, underneath the glute. The piriformis is one of those that we talk about in the hip, that those those motions also. And when you turn your foot outward, that actually is a function that comes out of the hip joint. So we'll talk about that at that point. Are, are you with me or is that too much material? I'm still here. Good. If I lose you because I can't see you, you have to stop me, okay? Um, because I love okay. talking about this stuff, as you can tell. So that's the three of them of those SIDS muscles. And then the fourth is the subscapularis. And that one is, this is a good visual to see that one because you look through the rib cage and it's underneath the shoulder blade and then reaches to the inside of the humerus. And so it, it also holds that humerus in. And instead of turning the arm outward, or the hand when you have it bent, it, this one brings it inward, so it does the opposite motion. So these are, you know, these are important muscles because a lot of times people wear these muscles out because they're not really only moving things, they're holding the shoulder into the shoulder joint. So they're kind of stabilizers. And so that can be tough. And especially the supraspinatus up here, <clears throat> And that's actually why this is a very good picture. I didn't even realize this. See this right here? That is a cut here. See that cut? That is the place where the supraspinatus often gets torn. And that's what they call a rotator cuff injury. Have you heard of that before? You're scaring me. Why? I just, it's just sometimes when I see the pictures of muscles, I'm afraid that I might tear them in the future. Well, let me tell you this. So I have, I have patients who are 90 years old and plus. And I have, and it's very interesting. I have, I remember I have one lady and she is like, she's, you know, she doesn't like drink water. She's just drinks her coffee and stuff. And her muscles at 90, they feel like, you know, dried up and jerky a little, beef jerky a little bit. But then I had a lady, she's 92 also, and she drinks plenty of water. She eats salad. She's, you know, she can't stop talking about her healthy food things. And her muscles felt like, you know, a 20-year-old muscle. And so I'm not so sure that it's just the fate, you know, of these things needing to happen. But I think it's important to know, you know, what's going on so you can be a good steward of your body and not just push through, 
you know, uh, uh, pains and eat ibuprofens only, and then at 40 or 50, you're falling apart. Does that make sense? So I just drink a lot of water and eat a lot of salad then. Yeah, good vitamins, you know, eat the rainbow, di rainbow diet, salads are good, vitamin C right now. Oh, yeah, I uploaded, I uploaded um, a coronavirus something in an announcement and I underlined the most important parts. It's, it's um, an initiative from Andrew Val Clinic, and that's a functional medical doctor. One of my patients is a functional medical MD. And she uploaded it for me, so I put it, I forwarded it to you guys. So what? Uh, uh, in there, talking about vitamins, they are thinking vitamin C and vitamin D is very important right now to 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 combat the virus stuff. And yeah. also magnesium and zinc, and meditation and sleep, which is what we've already learned about a little bit. Um, no, but you don't have to be scared about these muscles, but it's good if you know what, um, because most of these things heal on their own. What happens is when, when we are foolish and we keep going and don't take the warning signs of the body and just eat a, a, a pain pill because we want to just push through every time and don't adapt our lifestyle, that's when we get into trouble. But most of the time, we do those behaviors when we don't know. Like, I have a bad back, and sometimes my back, you know, really pisses me off. But um, And I have to talk to it nicely because it's been holding me up. But if I wouldn't know what's going on, I would, have a, I would be scared. But if I know what's going on, and injuries of backs or of shoulders or so, they're generally not like a cold where it comes and goes and then it's done. It's more like an asthma where you just we have to, you know, deal with our weak spots in the body and then it's okay. You know? I have a bad back one day and the next day I push a radar guy against the wall and adjust his back. And, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting. So don't be worried about that too much. I don't mean to scare you. Right. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go further. So let's see. So that was the sits muscle, the rotator cuff. So now we've covered the muscles that attach the shoulder blade to the chest and the, the, the trunk. And we've also touched on the muscles that anchor the arm into the shoulder blade. And, that, and now we're going to go and talk about muscles that move. The arm, and when you talk about the arm in the body, in the extremities, or the top extremities, you mean the upper arm. The forearm is the elbow to the hand. And so um, to finish up, we're going to talk about uh, a few muscles here. One that raises your arm up in the front, the shoulder flexion. Uh, so raise your arm up in the front, the shoulder flexion. What muscles bulges and contracts when you do that? The one on the top deltoid? The shoulders, definitely. Which one? The deltoid? The deltoid, exactly. So let's go through that here. So the deltoid is a big one for those. There we go. So the deltoid is this interesting muscle that's kind of like the trapezius goes from here up and towards the spine, and then the deltoid starts at the same place where the trapezius starts. Oh but it goes into the arm and it anchors into the deltoid tuberosity, which is why I, you know, wanted you to uh, learn that attachment place. And it basically does a whole bunch of stuff. It brings the arm forward, it adducts it up, it even brings it back a little bit. The main, main one that is primary they talk about is the abduction, which is just close to the outside. All right? And... But it does also this flexion, shoulder flexion. Then another muscle that helps move the arm is attached in the front of the chest, right there by the ribs and the chest plates. That muscle's main pull of the humerus is towards the midline, which is adduction. What's that muscle called? Unmute. Huh? Anybody? Uh, um, I'm looking. Look, look, look. That's your fault. There it is. 
You see it? Yeah. It's got to be the peck major. So it's attached. Wait, let me put the picture. It's attached clavicle, chest plate, and actually even in the ribs down here. And then it goes into the arm, right by the armpit in there. And so that one mm. brings the arm nicely downward and back into the chest. And so now, and then I think we have one more question, and that's the one in the back. What know. muscle is that? The next muscle is found towards the back. It pulls, it, uh, pulls the arm back in extension. It's very well developed in swimmers. Deltoid. No, the conquer. No, Which deltoid. One? Is it the deltoid? No. That's the third one. I thought it was the third one. Yes, the latissimus dorsi. <laughs> So that's this one down here. So that you can see, this is this is freaking me out every time. Look at his step. Look at this at Lissimus Dorsey. That's Michael Phelps. And these are the other guys who also won the swimming contest, the Olympics. This is huge. And so the more it's attached all the way here on the vertebra down to the crest on this lumbodorsal fascia, they call that, that white stuff. And then it goes all the way up into the same place, practically, where the pectoralis major went. And you can only visualize when that muscle contracts, how strong that pull down force is. And you can see that in freestyle, when it's in freestyle. And so that's the latissimus dorsi. Huh? He's just in my face. Yeah, he is. Wait, oh, nothing? Okay. Um, so, so with that, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So now we have on the arm moving end, we have a muscle in the front, the pec major. We have a muscle in the back, the latissimus dorsi. And we have, and dorsi means back. Dorsal means towards the back. And then we have a deltoid muscle, and the deltoid muscle... You know, it's an inverted triangle. That's a deltoid uh, uh, shape. And so the only one that I have here left is the teres major. And do I have a question on the teres major? No. And the teres major is basically a helper of the deltoid muscle. I mean, the latissimus dorsi muscle. So if you if you if you see here, the latissimus dorsi comes from the bottom here up into the into the arm and the teres major catches on and from the tip of the shoulder blade on the bottom and reaches into the same well, uh-huh huh? oh any question no okay good and so that's the teres major that's the one more there and then the last one in the arm movers that i put in is one that's called that coracle brachialis and you see the word here says it starts at the coracoid process and goes to the brachium. And the brachium is uh, uh, the, upper, the arm area, the upper arm area. <clears throat> and that muscle is a very small helper. It, it basically stabilizes the arm. So, it, you know, when it pulls on it, when it, when it, when it. Go get it back. Go. All right. So that's a similar helper with the, the deltoid arm flexion adduction a little bit. So I think those are all the ones that I feel like I want to check on in today's session. Yeah, that after that we get to the elbow movement. So those are the next ones. So do you understand this stuff a little bit? Yeah. Yeah? Do you have any questions about it? Um, no, I don't think so. I've actually, uh, this is pretty helpful. Doing it on doing it like this is helpful. Talking yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. Having it right in front of me and talking about it, I feel like it's yeah. It's really helpful. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm a little bit lost because I don't see you guys, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> well I did